I just need to pop the tips in the shot. Yeah, that's cool. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see everybody here this morning. Start out this morning, go by, greet everybody, say a special hello to our special guest, Mr. Runk Runkles. I hope I said that right. And uh, let's just have a good time in the Lord. Amen. All right. What's up? How are you doing? Awesome. Hey, down. Financial statement focused on the board by the office back there. 
I'm going to share with you real quick. Um, it's from John 14 and verse 13 and 14. And whatsoever you should ask in my name, that will I do, 
that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You should ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's not saying he's going to make you a millionaire. You know, you going to ask for a million dollars. God knows what you need. You might be, you might be delivered, want to be delivered from depression. You might want, you might get delivered from cancer. You got to ask God, though. You know, he, 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 he's waiting. He, he might be holding a blessing waiting for you to ask. I mean, we, we've heard testimony this week about how he delivered you from alcoholism, how he delivered from drugs, how he's delivered from sin. We've heard this this week. I mean, it's been great. I can say, well, go, I'm, I'm on bar. <laughs> I just can't, I just can't hold, hold it back. Because God can deliver you from anything. Um, he, he might need healing. God can heal you. And whatever you need, God can do it. You just got to ask. Amen. And sincerely ask. Don't just, you know, I, Lord, I'm sitting here, heal me. You know, ask him, humble yourself and ask God for deliverance from anything. It might be depression, it might be anything. God can deliver you. He, he wants you to ask, though. That's all I got. <laughs> I still love the fact that uh, Mike is our announcement guy, but he likes to preach that sermon more than anything. Amen. He's going to take my job. Uh, you know, God is an amazing God, and we can't get enough of the scripture. Amen. Amen. And uh, I just, you know, can't say enough about what has happened this week. It has been an amazing week in the world. Amen. Morning. But uh, this is our time now that we come to the Lord in prayer. Here at First Church of God, we believe in the power of prayer. But more importantly, we believe on who we're praying to and who we're communicating with. Amen? Amen. And here at First Church of God, you guys know, but I'm, I'm, we have a guest. So I'm going to let him know how we do this thing, if you will. As we come to the Lord in prayer, the first thing we do is we praise him. Amen? Because he is worthy of our praise. If God is not will not do anything other else in our lives. I can tell you right now, loved ones, you know this and I know this. He's already done more than enough. Amen? And that makes him worthy of praise this morning. So we can lift up our praise as we come to God. Next, we lift up our petitions or our requests, our needs, if you will, because that's what he's wanting from us. Just as Mike said earlier, we have not because we ask not. You know, he wants to be interactive in our lives, and that's what we do. But with that, as he were saying, with that uh, petition, then we stand on the promises of the word of God. The promises that we know that are hold true because then we know that it's not by our will that these things are being done, but it's by his will. Amen. So is there any praise report that we want to let publicly known right now? Miss Angie? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, five years ago, I had a mammogram done. They diagnosed me with breast cancer, and God took care of it. And um, two weeks ago, I had another mammogram done, and they said something else. So I go, have a biopsy. The doctor said, it's a cancerous mass. <laughs> Is right here, and he loves us. Amen. And even if he wouldn't have answered that way, Angie, it was still more than enough. Amen. Amen. But God, because we ask, we, we we that just makes our faith magnify even more as the time is coming. Amen. This is what we practice. This is what we praise Him. 
We petition and we stand on the promises, and that's what we did. Amen. So glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Here the doctor said that it was a cancerous mass, and we said, no, it ain't. Our God, our God told us that, didn't he? That it was going to be nothing. How many people, though, when they surrounded uh, Miss Andy, said that was going to be nothing on that result? I know I was one of them. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That is the answer directly from our God. Who else has got a praise report they want to share this morning? Miss Joyce. <laughs> yes. Welcome back. It's good to have you. Miss Teresa. Her last night, and I couldn't get over how strong her voice was. It hadn't right. been that way since she's had a wreck. That is worthy of praise. Anybody else got a praise report? I just want to say, oh, this how many have, how many got saved this week already? Not, that's where I was going, brother. Nineteen oh, responded so. to the Lord. Woo! That's the one we know. That's the one we know of personally, but who knows who did what? Only between them and God. And I know for a fact that tonight, guys, four of them 19 are being baptized. So praise God. That is worthy of praise. Amen. We have had a phenomenal time at the youth rally because that's what's been going on. Our youth is responding. And not just our youth, but our youth in Christ is responding. Amen? Amen. We had recovery groups and they were coming up. And giving their hearts and lives to the Lord. So we don't really know what that number is. But we know for certain 19 responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is praiseworthy. Anybody else got a praise report they want to share? All right. Now is our time for petitions. What requests or petitions that we're going to ask collectively so we can lift up in prayer as we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, Ms. Teresa. Miss Lisa. Okay. Anybody else? Bobby. Okay. Miss Sheila. Absolutely. Let it be more than just a hype. Amen. Let it be inspiring and continue to change and grow in them. Absolutely. Anybody else? Fine. Let's remember my son. He's going through a divorce. Another one. Um, Y'all remember him as he does that. And I just want to thank the Lord that uh, Keith Barry gave him a Bible. I hope he uses it. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Tim. Uh, just to continue keeping my mom in prayer. Uh, like I mentioned, it's Sunday school, keep her in prayer. We're in the process of trying to look for another place. Okay. 
Anybody else? Yes, Ms. Nancy. I guess mine's more of a branch report. Everybody here that we had six children in our class this morning. <laughs> Praise Thank God. Thank Miss Margaret and the best ministry. Amen. Bobby. Um, Anybody else got a petition they want to lift up and make known publicly? All right, with our praise and our petitions, now we're standing on God's promise with these petitions. And I'm going to ask you personally, what promise are you going to stand on with the petition you made earlier? What promise out of the Word of God? Yes, Bob. Never leave us or forsake us. Anybody else? The Word will never come back for you. His word will never come back voided, that it will accomplish what it set out to do. Anybody else? All things are possible with God. Amen? There are promises we can stand on, Brother Boyd. Asking you shall receive. Asking you shall receive. Do y'all believe that? Amen. 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 Anybody else? Rick. He says, I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can think or imagine. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. He is my strength. You stand on that one, don't you? And you're going to continue to stand on it, won't you, Miss Teresa? She's not giving up on her kid. Y'all notice that? And she's standing on the promise that has been applied to the Word of God. Amen? Anybody else? We can stand on them words this morning. If you could, please join me and stand as we come to the Lord's Prayer. As Mike said earlier, we have op open communion here. If you want to take communion, uh, it's at your discretion. doesn't mean you become part of the church of God. It's you identifying that you belong to the kingdom of God. Amen? Uh, after we pray, we're going to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with God. As we've been saying all week, this wood has no power, but what you do at an altar can alter you. Amen? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for this day that we give that you've given us. We thank you that as we celebrate Palm Sunday, your triumphal entry, we understand truly what that means in our hearts and our minds. Lord, you heard each and every uh, petition that's been lifted up to you. And Lord, we're standing on your truth and your promises this morning. So Father God, just continue to be with us this morning as part of our worship is praying and coming in fellowship with you this morning. We love you, we thank you, and it is in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. These altars are open. Let's spend some time with the Lord. <laughs>
God is good. All the time. All the time. And all the time. All right, just good. Let's, uh, let's just continue to praise God for what he's done. Because he's a good God. Right? <laughs> Jesus, who is that? Yeah. Every war he waged. 
like that, Brother Billy, and if you do, I'm apologizing. So it's kind of like an inside joke, guys. You had to been here, you know. So I've been uh, ribbing him ever since. Like, I call him Brother Rumps now. You know? <laughs> but uh, today we celebrate loved ones Palm Sunday, and a lot of people think we know what Palm Sunday is about, because, I mean, if, if you've been for lack of a better term, churched at all, you know that this is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And on that donkey, they were laying palm branches in front of him. And it was what they also call traditionally the triumphal entry. If you will. But there was a lot going on 
in that scenario that we, we can easily overlook and miss. And so today we're going to be starting where it started at. Normally when somebody's preaching on Palm Sunday, they use, you know, the in the Gospel of John chapter 12 is where they start. But we're not going to start there this morning. We're going to actually start in Zechariah chapter 9 where that prophecy was originally stated. In verse 9 through 9, uh, 9 through 13. So if you have your Bibles, please join me in Zechariah 9, verse 9 through 13. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the fowl of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant have I sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope, even today. Do I declare, declare that I will render, render double unto thee? When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. Brother Tim Bain, could you pray over this morning's sermon, please, sir? Oh, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for you. Lord, I just, you uh, have this plan from the beginning. Lord, I'm just so grateful that you, Jesus, went through with it and made that triumphant entry back in. Lord, I just ask that uh, you be with Billy as he delivers the messages for you. If any word is not from you, I ask that you take and open our ears to hear and our hearts to take in what you have for us this morning. Again, I just thank you for all that you do in our lives. In all the praise of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> There's so much going on here, and, and this was an Old Testament prophecy from a, a, a prophet named Zechariah that this would happen. And the Jewish people would have known this, the, the ones of the culture would have known this scripture, and that's why they were excited on this day that they seen this happening, this, this man riding on this, this young donkey, if you will, into, and they, they, they were excited, they were ecstatic that they're their king that now is coming right now into the world. Well, he is here, and now he's going to save us from the uh, oppression, for lack of a better term, from the Roman Empire, because that's what was going on. At this time, it wasn't Israel in charge of everything. Matter of fact, they were still in bondage to some degree in captivity, if you will. But it was kind of like a, a calm captivity. You can go ahead and praise and worship how you want. You just better pay homage to Caesar. You better know who the real king is, if you will. And they were excited because here was coming their king and their savior, if you will, from the nation of Israel. And he was riding on the donkey as it was prophesied that he would in Zechariah chapter 9. And that's what they're celebrating today. That's that triumphal entry of their king finally coming back to his kingdom, if you will, to reign forever. And they were excited because they were expecting... Jesus at that time to, for lack of a better term, kick butt and take names. Amen. And here's our king. This is what we've been waiting for. This is how we've seen it. And we need to paint a, a little bigger picture. So y'all bear with me. Yes, I'm reading scripture today. I know some people are like, oh no, here he goes again. But guys, we got to keep it in word and we got to keep it in context. And sometimes we can take a little snippet of the word of God and make our own theology and our own understanding of it. But the reality of it is, is we need to read the whole scripture in context to really get the full picture of what God wants us to see. Because sometimes, and I'll get to this a little bit later, we get blurred by our own skewed ambitions and desires of what we want out of God rather than what who, who he truly is. Amen? So Isaiah chapter 53, which is another beautiful prophet that was prophesying of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in his time, he read this. He prophesied on this. It says, "Who hath, This is chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom, 
is the arm of the Lord revealed. For she, he shall grow up, grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that he, we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, an acquaintance with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was des despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied by his knowledge, that shall my righteousness servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We read these scriptures, and in hindsight, where we're at in 2024, it's easy for easier, if you will, for us to see the bigger picture of God. You know, it's interesting to me, though, that the Jewish people of the time and culture back then, they had Zechariah's prophecies to stand on. They had Isaiah's prophecies to stand on. But the problem was when, when Jesus was having his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the only thing that they paid attention to was what was going to benefit and profit them. See, when they saw Jesus coming into Jerusalem on this humble donkey, lowly, they knew that was coming in, but Zechariah 9, verse 1 through 9, you saw what it said. It said that when he breaks the bow, when, when he finally comes in, he's going to be the ruler, if you will. And that's all they heard. But see, Jesus had a bigger plan in that. If they would have understood what the prophet Isaiah that we just read, Isaiah 53 Looking at this, they would have known that he wasn't coming in like the original king that they pointed out. Do you remember the first king that was appointed? His name was Saul. That was who the men, who the people of the town wanted. Saul was very powerful. He was a very strong looking guy. He had long wavy locks. Jealous rooms. Yes. He had long wavy locks. He was a man of a man. He looked the part, if you will, of this great honoring king. And yes, God honored who they wanted as king, but he was anointing another king in the same process, was he not? A little ruddy, young shepherd boy named David. That was God's man. That was who God had pointed as king. So here they were expecting another great king, if you will, to come in and literally... I don't know what they were thinking, but I, I bet you they were thinking, well, our God doesn't need to ride in on a white horse. He can just ride in on a lonely donkey to show how much power he's got. He's about to flip this world upside down over it. And boy, we're not going to be under Roman oppression no more. Woohoo! 
are trying to eat, where they're laying palm branches in front of, they're bowing, they're paying homage. And Jesus the whole time, as it was prophesied in, in, in the book of Isaiah, that that's not what was coming and what was expected. It was completely different than what they were longing for, that promise of that salvation. But if we know the Jewish story and we know what is gone, and yes, there is a promise because I'm telling you right now, Israel is God's promised people. But how many times did God call out to Israel? And we see this all through the word of God over and over and over again. Repent, Israel. Repent, Israel. Repent. And they kept doing their own thing and worshiping their own gods. And God would have to put them in once again a situation where, the, unfortunately, my loved ones have to go to a point where they need me again. And the moment they were oppressed and they were in bondage or captivity because of their disobedience, what happened? They would start crying out to God again. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And time and time and time again through the history of the word of God, we see this in Israel. But if you know what Jesus said before this triumphal entry, or during it, if you will. He mourned. He mourned for Israel as he was having this triumphal entry. He said, oh, daughter of Jerusalem, only if you would have just came to me, I would have protected you. But now I'm here for a bigger purpose. Now I'm here for a bigger calling to God's people, if you will. See, the Jewish people at the time thought it was just for them. But the reality of it was, as Jesus was going into Jerusalem, for not just the reconciliation of Israel to God, but mankind to God. Amen. That triumphal entry was our triumphal entry. Because he was coming in for the reconciliation, loved ones, of us being even able to have a relationship with God. Excuse me. When we read... The actual story that took place now in, in, in the book of John. Let, let, let's just read that for a minute. Bear with me. You guys, you know I love to read the word of God. Amen? Amen. And it gets too much sometimes, but just bear with me. we got to see the bigger picture. John chapter 12, starting in verse 12. Listen to what it says. It says, On the next day, much people that were come to feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. My King James Version's got that capitalized. The king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat there as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh. There's that capital K again. Sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. Listen to this closely, loved ones. Verse 18. For this cause, the people also met him, for they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how that you prevail all nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. They're freaking out, man. They're, they're like, they're just following this Jesus guy, and we're about to lose our power. Uh-oh, the true king is now about to be established on the throne. What do we do? What do we do? It says, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of the state of Galilee, and desire him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. Man, word's getting around, amen? That Jesus is here, and this is what's going on, and wow. And Jesus answered him, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What a, what a, what a victory speech that we're about to read, folks. Just think about this for a minute. It isn't, I am here, y'all are saved, da-da-da, fear not. Jesus is not wearing his Superman Israel cape. He's not. What does he say? He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall 
and to the ground it die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. Wow, really, Lord? And he that lateth, hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it was thunder. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Verse 32 says, in it, it and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answering, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever. And how saith thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord hath revealed? Therefore they could not believe because I, that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw the glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, listen to this, loved ones. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejected me and received not my words hath, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken to myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak thereof, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. That is in context what was going on as Jesus was making this triumphal entry. Several takeaways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning. But several, several takeaways that we have as we read in context what's going on with this triumphal entry. The first thing and the miscommunication that we can have right now and, and, and cut that right now is a lot of people have a tendency to believe, believe it or not, loved ones, that, well, the Old Testament was about Father God. And the Old Testament was about the mean, corrupt, uh, angry God that likes to squish people like a bug because they weren't obeying him. That's a misnomer. That's not, that's misunderstanding the word of God. Well, the Old Testament's this, and now Jesus is now the New Testament, and he's kind of more of the hippie guy that's just like, hey, man, everybody, let's get along and let's kumbaya. That's a misnomer of Jesus as well. Jesus does love us, don't get me wrong. Jesus does care for us, and he's there. But at the same time, 
He's not just a complacent, you can get away with anything. Matter of fact, that's the reason why he came into Jerusalem. On this day that we celebrate as Palm Sunday, as that triumphal entry. Because he said the hour has now come that I must suffer. And he goes, and my soul is troubled. Did y'all catch that? Jesus himself, it wasn't like, let me go to the cross. I got this. It wasn't that he was bold. It wasn't that he was powerful. He was living word made flesh. Jesus had uh, not necessarily fears of what was going on, but he had, he was human. He hurt. He felt everything that we did, everything that we go through, his doubts. And he was a carpenter's kid. I guarantee you there was a time Jesus around 15 years old, 14 years old, hit his thumb with, with a hammer and went, huh, ah, thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. He felt pain. He felt cuts. He felt tiredness. He felt hungry. He felt alone. He felt all the things that are coming with us. And he said, what am I going to say about this hour that's came? Unless a kernel of corn drops, there will be no more life. He was symbolizing what he must do on that cross. His victory did not look like what other people thought it should. That's another thing that we can grab out of this Palm Sunday look. God doesn't always act the way we anticipate him to. Amen. Matter of fact, most of the time he does something so unorthodox, all you can say is that had to be God. Amen? Amen. We can't put him in the box, is what I'm and the, the Jewish rulers of that day. They were standing on the words and promises like Zechariah 9. But it says, because of the resurrection of Lazarus, did y'all catch that? They were like, oh, this must be the man. See, he was proclaiming his life and death through his friend as it was being glorified before he even went into Jerusalem. The resurrection, we would like to say Jesus was the first resurrection, but read your word of God as he wasn't. It was God that was able to raise from the dead, but Isaiah raised him. From a young man from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead long before he went, but it was to symbolize and get the understanding of what truly needs to happen. That we're all dead to sin. We're all dead to the oppression. And glory be to God, through Christ Jesus and the payment that he made, we can be raised again. And that triumphal entry had everything to do with him reconciling the world back to his father. See, that's the beautiful thing about Jesus, loved ones, is he obeyed his father to the very T. <laughs> Ronks, I'm going to share with what you uh, shared with us. And he goes, he can't preach this, but I can preach it because it's behind the pulpit right here, right? He said this, and I loved it, Ronks. He goes, he goes, please don't, misunderstand what I'm saying, but I'm spiritually retarded. And we're like, what do you mean by that, Runks? He goes, I can't do it right. I don't, I'm just a drooling idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. But God has me in that moment because I can't get it right. See, Jesus obeyed every step of the way, loved ones. Why? Because he knew we were all spiritually impaired. Amen. We all miss the mark. We all can't get it right. We, there is nothing that we can do that will make it right. The Word of God says our righteousness is like filthy rags. And look at the terminology of what them filthy rags are actually talking about. I was talking about menstrual rags. They were nasty. That's what our righteousness is. Ew, yuck. Everything that we're able to, we're not able to do it. But this victory that how many times that the Jewish people were looking for that victory. Oh, their king is coming. Oh, we got in trouble once again. Now here's our savior. He wasn't there for the Jewish people at that time. And yes, it's prophesied that there will be a remnant of the Jewish people left. But it was for the reconciliation 
of the Gentiles, as it was prophesied in Isaiah 53. See, we can look at the whole picture and go, now why couldn't they see that? Why couldn't they understand that? And the Lord gives the explanation of why they couldn't. It's because of the hardness of their heart that to this day they can't see. But guys, that, 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 that challenges me. Because don't get it twisted. God is coming and his word is fulfilled. And he will come be coming as that warrior. Not the lowly man on the, on the donkey. But on the man as the, on the white horse. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I'm here to, to, to challenge us today. Do we think that we have it all together? Note the word of God says that in the last day, Jesus even claimed this himself. Many will say, look, here he is. Look, here he is. Look, here he is. And he says, but don't pay attention to that. Right now, we got signs and wonders happening in our life right now. And I don't have time to go into detail. But April 8th is a very significant thing with the, the solar eclipse. They're saying that the Alpha and the Tav... And, and y'all look at what that means. The beginning and the end, the Greek symbols are going to cover our nation on, at that time. And a lot of people think that that's when our nation's going under judgment. And that actually, April 9th, starts the, the, the Jewish New Year, the, the year of Jubilee. And that year of Jubilee, they're supposed to sacrifice a red heifer. Well, red heifers haven't uh, been alive for many years. But now... One just miraculously was able to come up, and now they got this. Some people believe it was cloned. And they're ready to sacrifice this. See, prophecy is being fulfilled in our eyes just as fast as last two years, my goodness. There are several things that needed to happen technically, prophetically, that couldn't happen for the coming of the Lord until they were fulfilled. But now... We're there, guys. Everything is being fulfilled as God had promised. But because of that, listen to me. Let's not get so narrow-minded in Christ that we say, oh, we got this one pinned. This is how it is. Because I promise you, loved ones, just as he did in the past, it's not going to happen like you anticipate. It's not going to happen like you think it's going to happen. What does Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 say? Trust in the Lord. With all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. The key now loved ones is to be ready. Regardless of how it goes down. Or regardless of where. This guy is saying this. Or this guy is saying that. Or this king's doing this. Or that president's doing that. Yes and lo and behold it's an election year. Go figure right. Y'all know how stupid our world gets. During every four years. I don't have to go into detail on that. Amen? Our world gets crazy. But trust in the Lord because His Word, He's faithful to His Word and to His promises. Amen. And that triumphal entry, that, that Palm Sunday that we celebrated. See, even Judas. You know, Judas, people, people, hear me out, don't throw stones at your pastor. They give Judas a, a, a bad rap because we see where he betrayed Jesus. We see that and we think in, he was betrayed. And it was prophesied that that would happen. Guys, when it's prophesied that it was ha that would happen and, and, and God said it, unfortunately, it's going to come true regardless of what the intention or whatever it is. But we look at it in that story and go, how could he do that? But the reality of it was... When Jesus whispered to Judas and said, what you must do, do quickly. Judas was excited. He ran from Jesus that moment, Jesus telling him, and went to sell him out. Went to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. Why? Because that was prophesied that that would happen. But Judas' intentions was to force Jesus' hand of becoming the king. If he's under bondage, if he's under attack directly by the Romans for this, well, his kingdomship must come out. It must, he must stand bold like Saul with the waving locks and the big chest, and he was going to buff up and be powerful. 
And I bet you, for a half a second, when they came in with the Roman, uh, with the centurions and everything, and Judas was sitting there, and then Jesus asked him, why you betray me with a kiss? And then, then when they asked him, you know, are you Jesus? Are you Jesus? And he said, I am. And when he said, I am, they blew backwards. I bet you Judas was excited for half a second. I can almost be certain. Here it is. Here it is. It's going to go. Here it is. But he paused. Oh, Peter switched out that butterfly knife. What? <laughs> Chopped off that boy's ear. He's ready to die right there. He was. Ride or die, baby. Peter was a ride or die. But God even knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. Jesus did. He says, you may be ride or die at this moment, but when true persecution hits, you're going to deny me three times. That's another thing that we can grab out of this. We may think we know God pretty well, but I assure you, loved ones, God knows you a lot better. Amen. God knows who you are a lot better than who you know who you are. And that's why we can trust in Him with everything. When that happened, I bet you Judas and Peter both were freaking out. This did not happen the way I anticipated. See, that's the beautiful thing in sovereignty of God, is you may think that you can control Him. The reality of it is, is you can't. We may think that we can go, hey, God, act on my behalf. Now, there are promises that we can stand on, that we do, as we do every Sunday morning when we're standing on his promises. But why are we standing on them? It's because it's what he said. It's what he said, and that's what we're fulfilled in. That triumphal entry set the course of the end times. A lot of people don't realize that. Do you know we've been in the end days for the last 2,000 years? Jesus, when he first came, and John the Baptist, if we remember, what, what, what was the first proclamation of the gospel? It wasn't, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It wasn't that. Matter of fact, that's hard to find in Scripture. Think about that for a minute. That didn't happen until the book of Acts. What must we do? Accept and believe and repent. But Jesus and John the Baptist, what was their first one? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven was coming soon. No. For the kingdom of heaven will be in 2,000 years. No. They said, it's at hand. It's now. Because we don't realize, loved ones, that we think we have time. We think that because we live in the click, 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 that we have time that, well, you know what? I still got one more run in me. I can do what I want. The reality of it is, is you're already in eternity and don't know it. The reality of it is, and, and this is mind-blowing when you truly think about it, but if time is just designed for us, because that's what it was, God's outside of time. He's the one that said, in the beginning, God created. He's the one that made that alpha. He's the one that made that omega. He's outside. I am the alpha, the omega. He didn't say I was the alpha and will be the omega. He's outside of time. So if that's the case, loved ones, right now, believe it or not, you're either eternally in heaven with God or you're burning in hell. Wow, that's a hard reality to think of, isn't it? But it's true, outside of time. But glory be to God. Are y'all doing this? If, if you're able to breathe, take a deep breath this morning. Blow it out. If you're doing that this morning, you still have time. You still have opportunity to accept that triumphal entry that Christ would later that week go to Calvary and die for you. You have that opportunity to change your destination, if you will, because you're still within time. Maybe, just maybe, that's the reason why God had been in time to begin with, to give us that opportunity, that time to be reconciled to Him. The King is on the throne. He's had His triumphal entry. He's went to the grave and rose again. And don't get it twisted, loved ones, because 
who that king of Israel is waiting for, he's coming back as well. John the Apostle wrote on the Isle of Patmos after he was boiled in water and they didn't know what to do with him. So they'll, they, they just thought, you know what, we'll just put him on an isolated island. And so he can't bother nobody else because can't kill him. We done tried. And the Lord did the most revelation that we know, that we know of the book of Revelation. And he understood and he broke this and he penned this. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16. And this is John seeing this in the heavenly spending time with God. And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew Wait a minute, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him up upon the white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that would it smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just because it doesn't happen the way we think it does, or even in the time frame that we think it does, I promise you this, loved ones, if God spoke it, then words are faithful and they were true and they will come to fruition. There will be a day all wrongs are made right. There will be a day that judgment comes to this world. There will be a day as the Jews were waiting as he was going into Jerusalem that he will rule and have sovereign rule over every wrong thing. But if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we understand how the Apostle Paul understood this. We, we, in our Sunday school, talked about Stephen, the first martyr. You know, he was, he was high up in rank in the disciples, right? No. No, he wasn't. The, the, the disciples, when, when the group started growing, we learned this in Sunday school, when the group started growing and, and the church of God was growing, if you will, the disciples were like, that some of the Greeks among them were like, hey, we got widows that need to be taken care of. The disciples were like, hey, we're supposed to be spreading the gospel of the Lord, but we can't throw away our widows, so we need men appointed over them. And they appointed seven, and Stephen was one of them. Stephen's job was to feed the widows. That's what his job was. He wasn't the man behind the pulpit with the great authority or whatever. No. He was a common dude that just loved the Lord and had compassion for others. You know that's what it all it takes. What are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love people. Amen. In that you become the conduit of God's power. But if I love God and say, shut up people, I cut off his power. If I'm all about the people and doing the ministry, but God, hush, I'm trying to do your work, my power is cut off. And Stephen understood that. When he was stoned, he wasn't waiting for a king to come on a white horse. Steve looked into the heavens and saw Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father as he was being stoned to death. He understood that where, what he had was timeless, loved ones. I encourage each and every one of us tonight, or today, man, I'm getting mixed up, it's been a long week, bear with me. I encourage each and every one of us, though, as we long for the coming of the Lord, is it not possible that we can't see him inside us right now? Yes, there will be a day that he comes and parts the clouds as it was prophesied that that would happen. But right now, as today is today, you can have that presence of Almighty God and that peace that surpasses all of us. All because of what he was doing as he made his way to Jerusalem. It made the ones in authority at that time angry. All the way to the point they wanted to kill him. 
But yet, as it was prophesied through uh, Prophet Zechariah and Isaiah and several others, that was God's beautiful plan to begin. And that's something else that we can gather from Palm Sunday. God's plan is not always our plan. But what a mighty, awesome God he is. And when he, I bet you now, all the disciples, I, I think of what the Gospel of John says, and he says, when after the fact that he came back and was resurrected and he was eating with them next to the campfire, eating fish again. I love my Lord because he likes to eat. Amen? <laughs> I ain't got to worry about diabetes up there. I'm going to eat with my God. Amen? <laughs> and I'm going to be excited about it. But as he was sharing with them loved ones, he said that he, he showed himself in all the prophecies, in all the, the law of God, Oh, yeah, the commandment here, yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah, this prophecy. And I bet they were scratching their heads going, oh, how did I miss that? I, I see it the same way. Uh, we were talking last night with our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Last night, Brother Runks, he's a Southern Baptist, and how all that gibbly gut really don't matter. The truth of the matter is, is are we giving our hearts and lives to Jesus? Amen. Right. And we were talking about how in heaven... We're all going to be sitting around going, oh, I really miss that one. Every single one of us are. Every single one of us are. Because our ways are not God's ways. Right. But all we have to do is trust in Him and love one another. That is what the victory that we celebrate in Palm Sunday. And as we go into, I don't like to call it Easter, I like to call it Resurrection Sunday. That is the victory that we can have. That is the proclamation that we can walk in. Dying to ourselves and now being new creatures in Christ. We've been giving that. We've been accepted that as children of Almighty God. Now That excites me. Amen? And the beautiful thing now, because of that triumphal entry, it is not just available to the Jewish people, but it's available to us all. Amen. I pray that each and every one of us enjoy our Sunday. Uh, can I get the praise and worship team up here, please? I don't like to close at all without giving one more opportunity for us to just spend time with God. And we got mostly home folks here, and I'm assuming that everybody's mate, and that's a wrong assumption. That everybody's made that trip to the altar to accept the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There may be somebody on Facebook land or YouTube land that hasn't done that. And if you haven't, I encourage you now to come to the altar and accept that triumphal entry that's already happened. And if you've already made that decision, it doesn't hurt to come to the altar and thank Him for it. Amen? He is worthy of our praise. Amen. And traditionally, people are getting away from the altar, but there's something to me. This is just a personal preference. You can, you can pray right where you're at. Mater mater materially speaking, that chair is basically the same power as this wooden piece. You can do it wherever. But there's something about you sitting back here and then you standing up and putting action to your faith and walking forward and kneeling before God, that's faith activated in just the smallest piece. We've made it comfortable for people. We've made it pleasant for people. Sometimes God wants us to stand out in the awkwardness so he can bless it. Amen? Amen. If you're able to stand with me, please stand. We have one more opportunity and one more time before we close this service today for you to come before the presence of God. I encourage you to come. <laughs>
beauty and thirst for a drink from the well. Jesus is calling me. to experience what's going on if you haven't been here yet. It has been awesome. And guys, you got to just experience the presence of God that has been filling this room. It's been amazing. And I also want to say, and I normally don't do this, y'all know me, but if you notice over on our Welcome Center, there's uh, shirts that Runks has set up along with some bumper stickers and other stuff. But I assure you, loved ones, 
He's not printing off these shirts because they're cool and hip and it's neat to have. This is part of his ministry that helps support what he does. So he can go from state to state, nation to nation, if you will, from city to city to evangelize what he's doing. And he's not doing it for money, if you will. He's doing it because if anybody, if you've been here the, the last two nights, you know he's passionate about the youth and he's passionate about spreading the gospel. And the, and the purchase of them shirts, it helps with that. So if that would be something that you would uh, consider doing to help support, and he, he, he'd be willing to take donations even if you don't want the shirt, I guarantee. But all of it goes back into the ministry of what he does. So he can go from church to church across the nation and do what he does. There's some, we've been blessed, we were able to help that, but there's some churches out there that just don't have the finances. And he, that's what that's about. So he can still do that. I, I, I loved um, what the contract, when we had the evangelist come in, he said the closest possible to this. But she, he left it up to us. We could have gave him $2 and said, hey, man, that's as close as we can get. Because of the way it's worded in the contract. Because he's not doing it, loved ones, for the money. He's doing it to proclaim the gospel. And I, I can back that. I, I, I can get behind that. Amen? Amen. Also... Guys, be here tonight because, like I said, we're having a baptism to all that want to come forward and make that next step. And we need to encourage and support the ones that are making that awkward step of, you know what? It's cold out there. Hopefully it's heated by then or we're going to be cold. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. The baptistry is warming up as we speak. <laughs> and if you're watching and you're considering coming tonight, if you have a towel, bring it. We have a towel to cover you, but that would help save us on some laundry. Amen. So if you got a towel that you want to bring and you plan on being baptized, if you're able to, bring a change of clothes and bring a towel. Mr. Runks, could you do the honor of closing us? Sure. Church? Lord, thank you so much for us gather together as a body of believers. I thank you, Lord, for all signing its significance. Lord, I thank you for sending your sign to die for us. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.